good evening. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, VK3 EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 Charlie Sierra Juliet in Narry Warren South. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, VK3 EKH, broadcasting on prime frequency of 3541 kHz in the 80 meter amateur radio band and simulcasting on 1865 kHz in the medium wave band and also via the Melbourne television repeater, digital TV repeater, VK3 RTV on digital channel 2. Good evening chaps watching there. We are also broadcasting on the, the YouTube channel in full HD uh, on VK3 CSJ. So if you uh, go to the YouTube channel type in VK3 CSJ and look for the live <coughs> link to the broadcast here which can also be found on the ASV website at www.asv.org.au under the Radio Astronomy tab. Uh, we also have a Discord channel for chat that uh, can be found on the ASV website under the Radio Astronomy tab mentioned before. Uh, it's uh, open to all and uh, you can come up as you are or alias or whatever. Uh, we usually get quite a few people that uh, rock up on the Discord channel chatting between themselves while I'm talking but that's alright. And uh, <laughs> we also have a email address uh, vk3 ekh at gmail dot com dot no it's not no au it's just dot com vk3 ekh at gmail dot com that's right uh, <laughs> and uh, you're welcome to send uh, signal reports there I note that the band conditions on 80 meters might not be so good tonight uh, I was just listening to uh, Ian talking to um, VK3 UFO just a kilohertz up and uh, both signals weren't too good here so the short skip propagation on 80 meters might be a little bit poor tonight uh, but I hope uh, in general the signal is getting out uh, reasonably well for a, a decent copy and uh, also on 160 um, I hope the signal is getting out on 160 for a decent copy so I'd be interested in reports tonight particularly uh, on uh, the signals on 80 and 160 so uh, send us reports to vk3ekh at gmail.com and uh, I will keep an eye on the inbox there's already an email that's come through right now from our excellent shortwave listener there <laughs> uh, g'day Don and he's uh, giving me a report of uh, 20 over 9 on 160 and 30 over 9 on 80 so that's fairly consistent and doing pretty good. Thanks, so Don. That's um, the sort of thing I want to see. All right, look, we've got a little bit of video footage tonight from in various camps, and uh, I'll break away to that. Um, some there's one video footage um, that's got no dialogue really, so I'll speak over it. And uh, but only it goes for about uh, less than two minutes, but it's a little bit of visual. So, like I say, it'd be a good idea tonight to fire up the YouTube channel VK3CSJ and uh, uh, keep an eye on the, the YouTube uh, channel for any visuals that I, uh, I pop up. Uh, we've also got a weather report from our space weather woman, Timothy Skov, uh, W2, oh, I can't remember her course on now, but uh, I know she's a ham. So <laughs> anyway, we've got uh, the latest report from uh, Timothy on the solar weather conditions up till today at least. And uh, a little bit on the uh, Parker probe, the solar Parker probe. I want to give a little bit of report on the solar Parker probe. Um, and there's also something on the James Webb telescope. So there's more video footage tonight than there is me on the camera, which is uh, um, how I'm beginning to enjoy it these days. Anyway, a pleasant uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, there's already a couple of people up there on the chat window. Uh, we've got Martin VK7JAH, 80 meters better than 160, both pretty good, however. And uh, Richard's there, Mr. VRS, and uh, let me know if anything seems skew if tonight. Um, and um, 
that's all I can see there at the moment. So uh, I'm not sure where Uncle Robert is, but nevertheless. All right, let's get into it. Uh, it's five past the hour, 11.05 UTC. The Astronomical Society of Victoria, founded in 1922, uh, comprises well over 1,600 members. Membership of the Society, of course, is open to all members or to all persons with an interest in uh, astronomy or facets of the science. The Society objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy, to disseminate the knowledge of the science and to provide a greater facility or greater facilities for the study among its members. We have monthly meetings which are usually held on the second Wednesday of every month except in January, the later being held on a Saturday night. Meetings start at 8pm at the Mulia Hall or the National Herbarium in Burwood Avenue, not too far from the Melbourne Observatory. Parking is available in Burwood Avenue, Dallas Brooks Drive and the surrounding streets. Admission is free and visitors are most welcome. And I would say that uh, for, for this year outstanding at this stage, uh, monthly meetings will now be conducted at the hall in Melbourne quite successfully and uh, also will be streamed on the uh, the ASV's YouTube channel so uh, uh, monthly meetings uh, will be very interesting this year I think in that from that point of view privileges of membership include the right to borrow books uh, periodicals and and um, other publications from the Society's extensive library located at the Melbourne Observatory. Uh, there's also a regular ag uh, magazine called Crux, ASV's uh, magazine called Crux, which contains updated articles, news, observing notes and the like. And uh, there's also the free provision of the Astronomical Yearbook. Um, which is a fine, absolutely magnificent little publication that ASC puts out every year for astronomers in the society, kind of like an almanac of sorts. Access is available to telescopes on members' nights held regularly at the Melbourne Observatory and other monthly meetings with the permitting. These instruments include the Society's 300mm equatorial reflector and a 300mm portable reflector. There's also a 200mm refractor managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens and a photoheliograph are also housed at the observatory and are accessible to members as well. The Society also has a number of 200mm refractors available for short period loan to members uh, that want to try before buy concept. Regular Society Club Night meetings are held on the first and last Fridays of each month at the Lodge, the ASV's club rooms, located in Burwood. Members are encouraged to use the Society's instruments located there to gain first-hand experience in telescope use. These instruments include a 508mm equatorial reflector and a number of smaller reflectors which members can use out in the little backyard that's there. Members are also encouraged to make use of the Society's country property located near Heathcote, some 90 minutes drive north of Melbourne. There are a range of instruments located there, <coughs> uh, the larger uh, two um, with, can be used with appropriate training. They range from 300mm to 1000mm aperture. Also located on the site is an 8.5 metre radio steerable telescope which members can access with involvement with the radio astronomy section. Members are encouraged to make and use telescopes. Advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same. Instrument making is only one of the number of common interest acti activities catered for within the society. Other areas of interest that members can participate in include deep sky observing, astrophotography, lunar and planetary observing, auroral, meteor, comet and radio astronomy, computing, cosmology and astrophysics, historical studies and research in astronomy in general. Contact details for various section directors are provided in the yearbook 
but if you don't have the yearbook, then uh, you can find more contact information via the ASV website. For further information, may be obtained by visiting the ASV website, as mentioned, and notifications of events are given in the Crux Extra Bulletin sent out via email to members every other week. Um, and they also say here that please note that the ASV will conform to all the government health uh, directives. ASV events may be required to be cancelled, moved or postponed accordingly. I think this year coming should, we should be pretty right with all that hopefully. If you want to write to the ASV, the uh, Secretary of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Pox uh, 1059 at uh, Melbourne, Victoria 3001. So that's the Secretary of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001. Otherwise, uh, just visit the ASV website at www.asv.org.au and all will be revealed. Uh, okay, this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, with the regular Friday night broadcast. Uh, we have VK3 Mike November has joined the uh, uh, Discord uh, window and is most likely watching TV as well. So, good day, Bruce. Welcome to tonight's session. Okay. Now, let's see, what I basically had uh, first up was the biggest galaxy ever found has just been discovered and it will break your brain, is the uh, title here. This is February 15, 2022. Just a few days ago, I've been actually meeting to read this out the last two Fridays, so <laughs> finally getting around to it. Now, there is a kind of a graphic here I can put up on the screen. Let's see if I can just dig that up quickly. Uh, there it is. And let's QSY to that image. Just bringing back the audio quickly. All right. Now back to the article. <laughs> the biggest galaxy ever found has just been discovered and it will break your brain. That's what they say. Jeez, I hope I can pronounce this galaxy. Anyway, uh, astronomers have just found an absolute monster of a galaxy. Yes. <laughs> How do you pronounce that? Um, Aesonus. Aesonus. Steve, how do you pronounce it? Aesonus. A A L C Y O N E U S. Celonus, Celonus, Celonius. All right. Anyway, is a massive radio galaxy. So that's that's what got my attention. It's a <laughs> radio. Uh, is Celonus is a massive radio galaxy, three billion light years away, that reaches five megaparsal parsecs into space. This structure which is 16.3 million light years long, is the largest known structure of galactic origin. Our lack of understanding of this colossi and what causes their remarkable growth is highlighted by this revelation. However, it may pave the way for a deeper understanding of not only massive radio galaxies, but also the intergalactic medium that floats through the vastness of space. Giant radio galaxies are just another unsolved riddle in an otherwise um, uh, amazing universe. They are made up of a host galaxy, a cluster of stars around a galactic nucleus containing a supermassive black hole and huge jets and lobes that erupt from the galactic core. These jets and lobes interacting with the intergalactic medium act as a synchrotron to accelerate electrons that produce radio emission. 
the source of the jets is almost certainly in uh, certainly an active super ma massive black hole at the galactic core when a black hole is guzzling down or accreting stuff from a huge disk of material surrounding it we call it active the accretion disk swirling around an active black hole does not always end up beyond the event horizon a small portion of it is di diverted from the accretion disk in a region to the poles where it is blasted into space in the form of ionized plasma jets that travel at a large fraction of the speed of light. These jets have the ability to travel great distances before dispersing into massive radio emitting lobes. This process is pretty normal. Even the Milky Way has radio lobes. What we don't really have a good handle on is why and in some galaxies they grow to absolutely gargantuan sizes or megaparsic scales on megaparsic scales these are called giant radio galaxies and <laughs> and the most extreme examples could be key to understanding what drives their growth if there exists host galaxy characteristics that are important so I just read that again. If the if there exist host galaxy characteristics that are an important cause for giant radio galaxy growth, then the hosts of the large giant radio galaxies are likely to possess them. The researchers led by astronomer Marjan Loi of Leiden Observatory in the Netherlands explains their preprint paper. Uh, which has been accepted for publication in astronomy and astrophysics. Similarly, if these, if there exists particular large-scale environments that are highly conduct conducive to giant radio galaxy growth, then the largest giant radio galaxies are likely to reside in them. The team went looking for these outliers in data collected by the Low Frequency Array, or LOFAR, L -O -F -A -R, in Europe, an interferometric, uh, interferometric network consisting of around 20,000 radio antennas distributed throughout 52 locations across Europe. They process, reprocessed the data through a new pipeline removing compact radio sources that might interfere with the detections of diffuse radio lobes and correcting for optical distortion. The resulting images, they say, represent the most sensitive search ever conducted for radio galaxy lobes. Then, they used the best pattern recognition tool available for locating their target with their own eyes and this is how they found Acrylonis, Acrylonis spewing forth from a galaxy a few billion light years away once they had measured the lobes the researchers used the Sloan Digital Sky Survey to try to understand the host galaxy they found that its fairly normal elliptical galaxy embedded in a filament of a cosmic web clocking in at around 240 billion times the mass of the Sun with a supermassive black hole at its center around 400 million times the mass of the Sun. Thus, oh, both, <laughs> both these parameters are actually at the low end of the giant radio galaxy which galaxies which uh, could provide more clues as to what drives the growth of radio lobes. Thus, very massive galaxies or central black holes are not necessary to grow large giants and if the observed state is represented of the source over its lifetime, neither is high radio power. It could be that a, a Solonus, a Cylonus is sitting in a region of space that is lower density than average which could enable its expansion uh, or that interaction with a cosmic web plays a role in the object's growth whatever is behind it though the researchers believe that 
a a Solonis, you're still growing even bigger, far away in the cosmic dark. And there's a kind of an image there on the screen of the lobes, the radio lobes. That's radio energy you're seeing depicted on the screen there. It's not optical light, at least. Um, the orange parts uh, is more to do with the RF, the radio detection side of it. Uh, as it says here, the radio lobes of a Solonius. Bloody Latin names they give these things. Good grief. <laughs> anyway, back to me. Alright, you're tuned to ASV Radio VK3 EKH. Uh, that was another story. All right, it is 21 past the hour. And uh, let me see if uh, we can queue up something else here. This is VK3 EKH, broadcasting 160 and 80. Um, the next thing I was going to talk about was this one, and that goes for that long. <sighs> and then we go on to Parker Probe. Yeah, what time is it? All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. No, I'll go straight into the Parker Parker Probe one, I think. So uh, I'll just put it to the side. All right, just getting the next article ready here. Um, g'day, Rob. Rob's up on the uh, Discord channel. Okay, NASA entertains. Oh, sorry, <laughs> entertains, that's right, no, it's no, no entertainment here, it's educational. NASA enters the solar atmosphere for the first time, bringing new discoveries. Now, this is a few weeks ago, uh, but the video footage is uh, probably what's more interesting. So, if you aren't watching me on the YouTube channel, VK3CSJ, I suggest you uh, rock up on the YouTube channel right now, uh, because I'm going to play a, uh, a short video. Um, courtesy of uh, General Engineering, uh, it was, and NASA, really. Um, okay, uh, for in, yeah, so, for the first time in history, a spacecraft has touched the Sun. NASA's Parker Solar Probe has now flown through the Sun's upper atmosphere, the corona, and sampled particles and magnetic fields there. The new milestone marks one major step for Parker Solar Probe and one giant leap for the solar science. Just as landing on the moon allowed scientists to understand how it was formed, touching the very stuff the sun is made of is made is ma but, um, touching the, the very stuff the sun is made of will help scientists uncover critical information about our closest star and its influence on the solar system. Parker Solar Probe touching the sun is a monumental moment of solar science and a truly remarkable feat said Thomas Zubakin, uh, Zubakin, the Associated Minister of the Science Mission Directorate of NASA headquarters in Washington. He says, not only does this milestone provide us with deeper insights into our sun's evolution and its impacts on our solar system, but everything we learn about our star also teaches us more about stars in the rest of the universe. As it circles closer to the solar surface, Parker is making new discoveries that other spacecraft were too far away to see, including from within the solar wind, the flow of particles from the sun that, can't, that can influence us at Earth. In 2019, Parker discovered that magnetic zigzag structures in the solar wind called switchbacks uh, are, pl are plentiful close to the sun. Are plentiful close to the sun, but but how uh, and where they uh, formed remain a mystery. Halving the distance to the sun since then, Parker Solar Probe has now passed close enough to identify one place where they originate the solar surface. The first passage through the corona and the promise of more flybys to come will continue to provide data on phenomena. Uh, that are impossible to study from afar. Flying so close to the Sun, the Parker Solar Probe now senses conditions in the magnetically dominated layer of the solar atmosphere, the corona, that we never could before. Um, the Parker Project scientist at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in, in Laurel, Maryland says, 
we see evidence of being in the corona in magnetic field data, solar wind data, uh, and visual images. And, uh, and yeah, that's right. We can actually see the spacecraft flying through coronal structures that can be observed during a solar cycle eclipse. Um, okay, so there's a lot more to that article, but what I'm just going to do is run into this uh, short video and uh, get that queued up. This is it here, and hopefully it will play okay. I think it will just start up all right. I'll just have to kill the microphone so you don't hear me snoring. Um, oops, wrong one. Uh, hmm. All right, <laughs> just getting ready. All right, so yep, yeah, this is uh, courtesy of NASA, and let's see who we play on this. Roll for ignition. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff of the mighty Delta IV heavy rocket with NASA's Parker Solar Probe, a daring mission to shed light on the mysteries of our closest star, the Sun. For the first time in human history, a spacecraft has flown through the atmosphere of the Sun, sweeping through the superheated particles of the corona, a momentous event that has provided scientists vital information on the nature of our closest star that may help us unlock its mysteries. The Sun's atmosphere, much like our own, is composed of layers. Where we have the troposphere, stratosphere and mesosphere, the Sun has the photosphere, the chromosphere and the corona. We have a saying, hotter than the surface of the sun, but the surface of the sun, the photosphere, is not actually that hot. It ranges from about 6,200 degrees Celsius at the bottom and 3,700 degrees Celsius at the top. That's about the same temperature as a welding arc, and air around a lightning bolt can reach temperatures five times hotter than the photosphere. What's weird is the outermost layer of the sun's atmosphere, the corona, is much hotter than the surface. The corona, starting about 2,100 kilometers above the surface of the sun, reaches half a million degrees Celsius, 80 times higher than the surface. That's like walking away from a fire and the temperature getting warmer as you walk further away. This is a strange anomaly and makes the Parker Solar Probe's achievement even more impressive. As, at first glance, it's easy to dismiss that the probe only flew through the upper atmosphere, when, in reality, the upper atmosphere is vastly hotter than the surface. The reason this occurs is one of the many unsolved mysteries of the universe, and as such, is one of the primary missions of the Parker Solar Probe, to gather information on the magnetic fields and charged particles in this region and attempt to answer this riddle. To understand the achievement of the Parker Solar Probe, Let's dive into the engineering and physics of its solar mission. The first big problem facing the Parker Solar Probe is actually reaching the Sun. Despite the Sun acting as the anchor for our entire solar system, getting close to it is not easy. In order to bring a satellite out of orbit around the Earth, we first have to shed its velocity so that it falls back to Earth. The same has to be done when trying to bring something out of orbit around the Sun Except, in this case, we are located one astronomical unit, or 150 million kilometers from the Sun, and traveling at 30 kilometers per second, and anything launching from Earth will be imbued with the same orbital velocity around the Sun. This means, in order to achieve a tighter orbit to the Sun, we need to lower the spacecraft's orbital velocity around the Sun. And this is an incredibly energy-intensive task, especially when you add the energy needed to escape Earth's gravity. So let's say we first want to get our satellite from the Earth's surface into orbit around the Earth. This will require us to accelerate our satellite to around 9.2 kilometers per second relative to the Earth's surface. The satellite is now in orbit around Earth and traveling with it at 30 kilometers per second around the Sun. From here, we need to perform something called a home and transfer this is an orbital maneuver where we either change the spacecraft's orbital energy to adjust its perihelion, its closest approach to the Sun, or its aphelion, its furthest approach from the Sun. To visit an outer planet, like Mars, we need to increase our aphelion by adding to the spacecraft's orbital energy. 
while reaching an inner planet require us to reduce our perihelion by decreasing our orbital energy. To reach Mars from Earth's orbit requires a delta V of around 2.9 km per second. To reach Venus requires about 2.5 km per second. This is found using this equation, where mu, this Greek letter that looks like a U, is the planetary parameter of the Sun, which is a product of the Sun's mass. R1 is the orbital radius we are starting from, in this case Earth's distance from the Sun at around 150 million kilometers, and R2 is the desired perihelion or aphelion. If we calculate the delta V required to reach the Parker Solar Probe's closest approach of 6.2 million kilometers, this would require a delta V of 21.4 kilometers per second, over 8.5 times greater than the delta V required to reach Venus. That's an incredibly high delta V, one beyond the capabilities of any rocket ever made. But on December 8, 2018, the Parker Solar Probe launched from Cape Canaveral aboard the Delta IV Heavy, the world's second highest capacity rocket, second only to the Falcon Heavy. To give the probe an extra push, the Delta IV was fitted with a special solid rocket third stage, providing an additional 3 km per second of Delta V for the typically two-staged rocket design. Yes, even with this added power, the probe would have never gotten close to the Sun. To achieve its record-breaking flight, one-seventh that of the previous record held by Helios 2, the Parker Solar Probe completed an astounding five gravity assists by Venus, with an additional two flybys due in 2023 and 2024. This number of flybys was needed because Venus is a relatively low-mass planet. The magnitude of velocity change a planet can provide is largely determined by its gravity, determined by its mass. In fact, the original plan for the probe was to do a single planetary assist by Jupiter, which would have brought the probe three times closer to the Sun, but this trajectory came with some issues. Because Jupiter's orbit is so much further from the Sun, the sunlight reaching the solar panels at its aphelion would have been 25 times dimmer, requiring much larger solar panels to power the spacecraft. This poses an issue when the spacecraft makes its way around Jupiter and begins to accelerate towards the Sun. The heat of the Sun would destroy the solar panels, and at this size, they could not retract and hide behind the Sun Shield. Other options were available. A radioisotope thermal generator could have been used, but this would have driven the cost, weight and complexity of the spacecraft up significantly. The real selling point for this radical new flight trajectory was the added time and data it would provide scientists to fulfill the probe's mission, to study the Sun. With the original Jupiter plan, the probe would have had just 100 hours inside the desired zone around the Sun, completing just two solar passes before the probe reached the end of its eight-year mission duration. While the new Venus plan would mean the Parker Solar Probe would take less than 150 days to complete its orbit around the Sun, allowing scientists to gather over 900 hours worth of data over the probe's 24 orbits around the Sun. The change in plan did come with a change of design, moving away from the original conical-shaped heat shield to the familiar compact flat shield. This shield is primarily constructed from 11.4 cm carbon foam, a truly fascinating material developed by one of the most prolific material innovation labs, Ultramet. Under a scanning electron microscope, the carbon foam looks like this, an incredibly porous material dominated by open space, making its internal volume 97% empty space, providing the heat shield fantastic insulation properties while also benefiting from carbon's thermal stability. Next, a carbon-carbon composite, which is made by combining graphite with an organic binder, such as pitch or an epoxy resin. This mixture was applied to each side of the foam before being superheated to transform the binder into a pure form of carbon, creating a carbon-carbon composite. Finally, a white ceramic paint was applied to the sun-facing side to reflect as much of that heat away from the sun shield before it had a chance to even enter the labyrinth of carbon beneath. From here, the rest of the spacecraft, besides a few specialized sensors and solar panels, had to be designed to fit within the umbra, or shadow, of the shield. 
There are several instruments that bravely peek out beyond the safety of the heat shield, like the Solar Probe Cup, one of the many sensors on board. This thing is easily the most impressive bit of technology aboard, completely unprotected by the sun shield. Its designers had to get very creative with materials. The Solar Probe Cup is a Faraday cup, which is a device that can count and measure the properties of electrons and ions coming from the sun, essentially giving the spacecraft the capability of studying solar winds and mass ejections of particles coming from the sun. This is the cross-section of the Solar Probe Cup. It essentially works by applying an electric field over the grid at the cup's opening. By varying the voltage, we can select or filter out particles that can enter the cup, giving us more data on what is causing current as these charged particles strike the collecting plate at the bottom of the cup. It's a very simple device in practice, but with the temperatures it's facing, 1400 degrees Celsius, just below the melting point of pure iron, the solar probe cup needed some innovative engineering. The first challenge was selecting a material for the electric grid that generates the selecting electric field at the entrance of the cup. This grid needed to be conductive and heat resistant, while also being machinable to create the tiny 100 micron spaced grid. Tungsten was chosen, the same material used in incandescent light bulbs here on Earth, as they are capable of surviving the extremely high temperatures needed to generate light. Tungsten light filaments operate at temperatures as high as 3000 degrees Celsius, so they are more than capable of surviving these temperatures. However, machining tungsten into a grid this fine is difficult. Micron scale machining like this is not done with traditional tools. You would immediately break the grid with the force required to shave the metal away. Instead, lasers are typically used to etch away material. But because tungsten is so heat resistant, lasers would not be capable of melting the tungsten to form the grid. Instead, acid etching was used. Next, they needed electrical cables capable of supplying the grid with power and carrying electrical signals away from the collecting plate. The two most commonly used conductors here on Earth, copper and aluminium, would turn to a pool of molten metal in these conditions. So, these were most definitely not an option. Any conducting cables in this part of the spacecraft had to be made out of niobium C103, a special alloy of 89% niobium, 10% hafnium and 1% titanium. All the external casing components were also constructed from this exotic aerospace material. Normally, wires would be insulated from the outer casing with plastic, but this wasn't an option for the Parker Space Probe and the engineers were forced to use sapphire to ensure the niobium wires were insulated. These are some extremely exotic materials to perform what is a relatively mundane job here on Earth. Other portions of sensors peeking beyond the sun shield are built in a similar manner. The magnetic field measuring instruments are hidden behind the shield, but they need antennas that reach beyond the sun shield in order to make their measurements of the sun's magnetic fields. These four antennas are also made from niobium C103. The solar panels were the next challenge. While cruising through its distant orbit around the sun, the spacecraft can fully deploy its solar panels without issue. But as the probe begins its sweep back towards the sun, heat will become an ever-growing issue. This can be counteracted somewhat by retracting the solar panels. But the spacecraft needs to maintain some power to operate its scientific equipment during this vital stage of flight. Here, two smaller, specialized, secondary panels remain sticking out in view of the sun and are cooled with water, which is pumped through the solar panels and into these black radiators attached to the titanium truss just below the sun shield. This truss is exceptionally light for how big it looks. The entire truss only weighs 22.7 kilograms, which even for low density titanium is very low for the size of the truss. The engineers at NASA have clearly triple checked their stress calculations to ensure this thing could use as little material as possible, which of course saves launch weight, but also minimizes the material available to conduct heat from the heat shield to the spacecraft bus. Testing these systems in the heat they are expected to meet is difficult on Earth. The Odeo Solar Furnace is our best approximation of the environment they would need to endure. 
This facility, built on a hillside in the countryside of France, uses 10,000 adjustable mirrors to focus light onto one concave mirror. The facility is capable of reaching temperatures as high as 3,500 degrees Celsius, over double the temperature that even the sunshield will experience. Parts like the Faraday cup and sunshield were placed in the focal point of this concave mirror and exposed to the temperatures they will need to endure. However, components like the Faraday cup also need to be tested while performing their sensory tasks. And for this, the engineers need a particle accelerator to simulate the electrons and ions it will encounter from solar wind. Combining a particle accelerator with this solar furnace was not an option. So the researchers at the University of Michigan came up with the bright idea of using four high-powered IMAX projectors to simulate the heat of the sun. And they found that the Faraday cup actually performs better when heated as the heat decontaminated the system. Much of the data we have received from these instruments is of little interest to the average space enthusiast. Raw data that will provide scientists with valuable clues to the nature of the sun. But there is one sensor on board relaying images back to Earth that we can all enjoy. During a solar eclipse, we can observe a beautiful phenomenon. Bright loops of light dancing around the sun. These fantastic patterns are created by glowing electrons sailing around the sun on magnetic field lines, distorted by solar winds. We have been able to observe the streams of high energy electrons from Earth and our solar observatories parked in Lagrange Point 1, but we have never, until very recently, been able to observe them from up close. As the Parker space probe dipped into the corona for its ninth encounter with the Sun, it began recording from its wide view imager, here on the spacecraft. The images it delivered looked like a car passenger's view of a passing snowstorm on a dark night. Bright atomic particles streaming by the probe as it dips into the eye of the solar storm. Beautiful images that no doubt are giving scientists unparalleled data on the nature of these coronal streamers. The solar probe will have many more rendezvous with the sun, with the next due in September of 2022, and with another two Venus gravity assists, the Parker space probe will be breaking its own records in 2023 and 2024, bringing us even closer to the sun. And while we are getting closer to the sun in our skies, we are also getting closer to recreating the sun here on Earth for boundless fusion power. The current record for fusion power is set at 70%, meaning we managed to reclaim 70% of the power needed to get the fusion reactor started. We are still well away from being able to actually create power using fusion, but ITER, a new fusion reactor, is due to be completed in 2025, with worldwide cooperation helping to fund its astronomical cost, upwards of $45 billion making it one of the world's most expensive science experiments in human history. This documentary on... Right. <laughs> Thank you, uh, courtesy of NASA. Thanks very much, guys, out there, uh, for that little piece. And... Uh, Let's certainly hope. Uh, up oh, audio. Uh, yeah, why is that? Oh, the wrong, uh, wrong fader. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I've got. Uh, I, I use fader eight on my mixer for the the main mic here on uh, HF, and I <laughs> went with the wrong one. Anyway, good evening, everybody. Trust uh, that was a very interesting little article on our Parker space probe that's uh, flying pretty close to the sun and uh, getting some magnificent results so uh, it's uh, something definitely worthwhile okay uh, at uh, 10 44 16 minutes to 11 um, I do want to run something else here uh, I'll go straight to the um, the James Webb one uh, let me see where is uh, that uh, I'm looking where am I looking here for that um, 
This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. This goes for three minutes. And uh, thanks, Wayne, for this. And it was, did I have something I wanted to read out on James? Um, snapshot. Oh, yes. Very short. Okay. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope finally sees stars. But there's still a lot of work involved, a lot of calibration required. The first stage of aligning the telescope's mirror segments is complete. The James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST, has opened its eyes to the stars. The mosaic, actually, did I get a, an image of that? Uh, let me just check my slides. No, I didn't actually get that. Okay, no worries. That's fine, we'll, get, we'll pick that up in a minute. Um, uh, yeah, so, uh, the mosaic is of a, a single star repeated in 18 images to bring the telescope's 18 hexagonal mirror segments into alignment. NASA announced the blurry star pictures were collected by the instruments earlier this month. While nowhere near the breakthrough images we expect from the telescope later this year, this alignment is a crucial step in getting the individual segments to act as one mirror. The completed first stage of the process is called segment image identification. To collect the data from the stars, the telescope was adjusted in 156 positions in prediction of the star's location in an area about the size of the moon, according to Marshall Perrin, Deputy Telescope Scientist for Webb and Astronomer at the Space Telescope Science Institute. Within the first six hours, researchers were able to identify the target star and then the images were formed into one composite picture. The process took 25 hours and in total Webb collected 1,560 images of the star. Now that the image is arranged in the correct order, the second phase of the project is called segment alignment and that, that will begin soon. This phase will bring the stars into focus by correcting any large mirror setting er errors. The final phase, image stacking, and a lot of astrophotographers are familiar with this one, <laughs> will bring the 18 individual spots of light into one point, creating a single image. Completion is expected in the next several weeks, and soon after, JWST will kickstart its science discovery missions. So now I've got just got all this little video here to play too. Um, let me see if I can. Oh, it's just ready to go. So it only goes for three minutes. Uh, let's just see if we can get this going without a problem. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, uh, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, with a regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Narry Warren South. Well, first of all, the first evaluation images came in in the middle of the night, but the team all came in and um, we gathered and we evaluated whether the, the camera was working well enough for us to proceed on with the alignment. And uh, as we analyzed those first, uh, you know, photons, if you will, um, the team was pretty positive that the camera was working properly and the instrument was working properly. So we, we picked a star that was very bright and didn't have any stars near it that would contaminate the image. We know that the primary mirror segments aren't aligned, so they actually act like 18 separate telescopes. And we expect to see 18 separate images, one for each mirror, that are a little bit blurry at this point because we haven't aligned or focused anything. And so we pointed at a bright star and we made a mosaic. We actually took the near infrared camera and we took images in different parts of the sky and then we looked for the 18 spots from the 18 different telescopes, if you will. And we were very excited to find them. And the 18 spots were actually fairly close to each other. So really everything was very close to what was predicted. We've identified which of the 18 spots is which mirror. At this point, we even know which ones are from the wings. And uh, it turns out one of the wings, you can actually see those three spots are a little farther over. Um, and, and that's sort of what we expected. Um, so we've identified all 18 spots, and uh, the next step is to make an array of them. And then we're ready to start uh, what we call global alignment, which is when each of those 18 spots will start to be 
aligned and focused. And that's sort of the, the last step before we take those 18 spots and put them on top of each other to start forming a single star going through the 18 separate telescopes. That's the work that will be starting soon. We also took a, a selfie of the primary mirror. We took an image of the primary mirror and that helps us understand the alignment of the telescope, especially the primary mirror, to the, the camera itself and the instruments. There's actually a special lens in the near infrared camera that you can put in and it allows you to take a, a picture of the primary mirror itself and in this particular case, one of the segments is pointing at a star, so that is the segment that lights up. But you can see the outline through the shadows of all 18 segments. And you also can see the outline of what's inside of the instrument itself, and we can see how well that primary mirror in the telescope is aligned to the instrument. And that gives us some initial confidence that the alignment looks good, and that's a good starting point for doing the alignment of the telescope. We have now gotten some data looking through focus, and we've been able to see that we don't see any surprises in the shapes of the mirrors that we're looking at. So, so far so good, but we do have a long way to go. I'm, uh, oh. I'm, uh, oh. Got to mute the uh, TV there. Ah, oh dear. Always get caught on that. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 EKH. Now, uh, all right, we'll uh, jump to uh, Space Weather Woman's uh, solar report, uh, Timotha, and uh, we'll uh, pick up uh, the latest from Timotha. So, uh, um, this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. Stand by. We have some fast solar wind from some coronal holes that are rotating in through the Earth's strike zone over the next couple days and could bring us some aurora down to mid-latitudes. And an old big flare player puts on a show on the sun's far side, and it's about to rotate back into Earth view. Those stories and more in the news this week. This space weather forecast is sponsored in part by Millersville University. Come get certified in broadcast space weather. Visit millersville.edu slash swen. Space weather this week is kicking into high gear and we have some eye candy to prove it. As we take a look at our earth facing disc, look up at the east limb right on the 15th, BAM! Did you see that? Now it may not look like much, but that was a massive eruption on the sun's far side, and I'll get to that more in a minute. Meanwhile, we also have two coronal holes. You can see them there. They are now rotating in through the Earth's strike zone, and they've been sending us some fast solar wind. And this is going to bump us up to storm levels if it hasn't already, and bring aurora down to mid-latitudes easily over the next 24 hours, possibly uh, 48 hours before things begin to calm down. But that's not even the whole story. As we were turn to the disk you can see uh, again in the east limb right on early on the 19th look at this whoosh see that pretty loop of an eruption that sent a solar storm off to the east of earth and then later that same day down in the south whoosh again there's another solar storm once again not earth directed but stereo's probably having a blast taking a look at all of this stuff meanwhile as we continue to look at the disk we don't see a lot of uh, big flare players right now but we do have the hint of one that's going to be rotating into Earth very soon. Switching to our far-sighted monitor, this is Stereo A and it's looking at the Sun just a little bit from the side. Now take a look at the East Limb in Stereo's view on the 15th. Wait for it. Whammo! Right there! Did you see that? That was a massive solar storm launch. This is the launch that we had a hard time seeing Earth's side, but Stereo captures it just beautifully. In fact, as we look further out, we can see in Suvi's imagery, you can see that big solar storm launch out like that. And then if we pull out even more, look at what Solar Orbiter catches. It's amazing how well we can image the middle corona and look how massive this solar storm is. It's a, a hint of what is to come in some of the spectacular imagery we're going to see from the EUI instrument. Anyway, getting back to the disk and the region responsible, this is old region 20. 
2936. Anybody remember that region? It's the one that I think last time I checked took out a few Starlink satellites. Oh yeah, well it's been busy on the sun's far side, I'll tell you. And it doesn't look like it's quite done. In fact, as it's rotating into view, we're seeing that it and its, its cousin, region 2938, they're still alive and well. In fact, when we use helioseismology and we take a look at how these regions have kind of evolved over the course of moving to, through the sun's far side and back around earth side you can see those dark shadows are telling you that those regions actually might have grown a little bit on the sun's far side but that's probably why it launched that massive solar storm along with a massive solar flare and a radiation storm that we actually felt here at earth so we'll see if this thing just kind of lost all its gusto now now that it's kind of you know, launch the biggie, and maybe it'll be all tired by the time it comes back around. So don't fret too much. This isn't going to be a planet killer. Don't worry about that. So we'll see what happens when it rotates back into view, but guaranteed it's going to boost that solar flux for amateur radio operators and emergency responders. And I know you need it because we've actually dropped out of the triple digits and we need to get boosted back in the triple digits so we have some good radio propagation again on Earth's day side for you. Switching to our moon, we are now passing through the third quarter phase on our way to a new moon, and by the 24th, the moon will still be about 44% illuminated. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. Switching to your solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are being hit by the fast solar wind from not just one but two coronal holes that are going to be rotating in through the Earth strike zone over the next couple days. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting uh, up to about a 65% chance of a major storm, and this will continue easily over the next couple days and in through almost midweek before things should settle down. So aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you should get a pretty good show over the next couple days. Now, mid-latitudes, well, we only have about a 10% chance of a major storm, and we could get minor storm conditions, but things are going to be a bit sporadic with these two coronal holes. It's not quite clear how good of a show we're going to have and or how long it will last. So only if you're dedicated should you chase over the next couple days, and then things will definitely be settling down by about midweek next week. Switching to your solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week, we do have a lot of active regions on the Earth-facing disk, and thus the big flare risk is not completely in the green, with especially region 2948. NOAA is giving us about a 10% chance of big flares from that region. All the other regions on the disk are reasonably quiet, but we do have old region 2936 that's going to be rotating into Earth view here in the next few days, so at the latter part of the week, you do see that M flare risk rise. That's just a precaution. We're not sure if that region is still a big flare player, but you know, we're going to have to stay on our toes. Meanwhile, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, you're going to love this. We do have that solar flux boosting back into the triple digits, and that's going to continue easily over this next week, possibly go even higher than what we've got it here. But that's also going to come with uh, a bit of noise on the radio band. So just going to have to deal with that. Also, you GPS users, well, as you can see, we do have a minor risk for radio blackouts, so be sure to stay vigilant, especially near the dawn and dust terminators over this next week. So the space weather this week has been all sorts of eye candy. Not only have we gotten some massive solar storms that have not been Earth directed, but they've been absolutely gorgeous, both to the east of Earth and on the sun's far side. But we also have some solar storming from some fast solar wind that's hitting us right now. So aurora photographers at high latitudes and even at mid latitudes, enjoy the shows that you'll be getting over the next 24 to 48 hours before things calm down and then stay vigilant because we do have solar storm producers that are rotating Earth side and we could get some Earth directed solar storms here, probably starting sometime next week. Now, um, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, you know, things are looking a little bit better for you. We do have that solar flux that's boosting and it's going to continue to boost. But of course, along with that uh, higher solar flux comes good radio propagation on Earth's day side, but it also comes with a little bit of noise on the band. So you'll have to be dealing with that. And then also you're dealing with that solar storm on Earth's night side right now. And that could make propagation a little bit dicey over the next couple days. And then now you GPS users well, 
things aren't so good for you right now. We have to deal with the rising solar flux, which doesn't make uh, low latitude reception very good. We also have a bit more noise on the bands and the risk of radio blackouts for you, which makes it kind of tough near dawn and near dusk. And we also have a solar storm going on, which doesn't help you at all on the night side anywhere near Aurora. So right now you're just going to have to hunker down and just be super vigilant. And if you're a drone pilot, be sure to calibrate your magnetometers often. I'm Tamma the Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching. Mm. Okay, thanks Timotha for um, the, the latest uh, report there on the solar weather. And um, uh, I've got a uh, current disk of the sun shot here too. Um, for those watching, the, that's the current disk of the sun, two, uh, two sunspots uh, there, uh, AR 20, 2955 uh, and 2954, and um, just quickly going there, <coughs> testing one, two, three. Uh, the solar wind is currently at 457.2 kilometers a second at 6.9 protons per cubic centimeter, and uh, current sunspot number is 23 the count it's interesting the well okay this, the, and the current uh, radio sun is hovering at 92 solar flux units it's uh, as it is right now uh, 92 when Timothy did her report it was clearly up around uh, that uh, 105 I think it was on her chart there but um, yeah, it's just taken a bit of a dip at this stage of the game Possible far side sunspots. Uh, now, as uh, Timothy said, NASA's Stereo A spacecraft is monitoring a pair of ultraviolet hotspots behind the sun's eastern limb, and these may be active sunspots. Uh, we'll find out sure this weekend, uh, as uh, spaceweather.com indicates. Um, and quickly going down, uh, as of February 25, 2022. Uh, there were 2,269 potentially hazardous asteroids. Right, and that, that just top the conditions off on this planet right now if we had a major collision. Um, <laughs> that's as far as I'll go on that one. This is VK3 EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with a regular Friday night forecast. Okay, well, I had... Um, there's probably two reports there I had to skip over tonight. Um, just ran out of time, considering that I like to uh, keep to the hour as such. So uh, I'll leave it at that at this stage of the game. Um, we've had uh, a few folks come in on the chat called window. Uh, thanks very much for uh, popping up, guys, there and chatting. Uh, Rob uh, Martin, BK7JAH. Uh, Richard VRS. And I think that's about it that I can see. Uh, Robert VK3 XRA. So, thanks everybody for uh, coming up there on the chat window, uh, and uh, Ian and Don for the emails too as well. Uh, a note to the low power situation there, Ian. Uh, <laughs> okay, that would explain a, a lot there why uh, the signals appeared a little bit on the weak side to me. Alrighty then. So I shall conclude the medium wave service uh, on 1865 kilohertz. Um, Thanks for everybody that was watching or listening on uh, on 160. Uh, and um, um, what, what do I normally say at this point? Um, um, yes, we'll be back again next week to do it all again, I guess. <laughs> uh, more information about uh, the society can be found at www.asv.org.au and um, explore the website, uh, become a member of the ASV if you wish, the membership is all there on the front page um, and uh, uh, of course there's uh, many other interesting aspects to the, uh, the site as well so we're giving a bit of a look looking at. Uh, okay so this is VK3 EKH concluding transmissions on 1865 kHz and bidding everybody there a very pleasant good evening thanks for listening and uh, we shall conduct a quick call back on 80 meters standby stations on 80 meters this is VK3 EKH ASV radio conclusion concluding transmission on 1865 all right so now we shall pick up on 80 meters and uh, let's just get a clear page here um, 
and I think everything else is pretty good. Um, all right, so uh, this is VK3 EKH listening on 3541. Okay, we've got VK3 ACZ, VK3 GL, VK3 VIN, and that last station. Oh yeah, okay, yep, got you there, uh, Martin. Uh, all right, okay. Uh, was there any other, oh, my headphones on, that's annoying me. Uh, was there any other stations wishing to call in, VK3, EKH? Uh, VK3, JDO, was it, Julia Delta Oscar? Roger, Roger, we got you. All right, to, I think it's Peter, VK3 ACZ, VK3 EKH, good evening. Oh, hang on, I've still got the wrong, uh, let me go, I've just changed my picture on the screen here, back to me, that's better. <laughs> Forgot about that. Uh, VK3 ACZ, VK3 EKH. Oops, wrong one. Thanks Peter, VK3ACZ, VK3EKH returning, very good, thanks for those uh, reports, excellent uh, to uh, to hear them actually. Um, I uh, I was running uh, uh, the linear this time today, so um, there's uh, a good 400 watts being used uh, tonight on 80 metres, and um, likewise on uh, 160, so normally I've been running barefoot uh, over the last... Uh, um, I don't know, several months, I guess, because I just haven't been bothered to uh, connect the um, afterburners. <laughs> so I, uh, I thought I'll, I'll, I'll muck around with that uh, this afternoon and, and run some leads and see what uh, what transpires. So uh, I'm glad to see that uh, the signals are being heard around the place just that little bit better, which is really good. Thanks, Peter. Excellent stuff. Uh, all right. Um, and I, I, uh, I often pop in on Chris's uh, uh, um, YouTube broadcasts on Saturday night and I uh, often listen to you guys uh, with your, your talk back on uh, Two Metres Back to Chris, which is always interesting, isn't it? Uh, really fascinating what Chris gets up to there, so uh, good on him. That's VK3 AML. Um, all right, over to you there, uh, Mr. Lewis, VK3 GL, VK3 EKH. Absolutely rocketing in tonight, that is for sure there, Clint. Um, 
unfortunately didn't get much of a chance to listen to the entire broadcast. Uh, I think I probably got the a majority of the speech with a, a woman update um, from, uh, from was it Tim, Timitha, um, with about all I, I managed to get hold of this evening because I've been busy at work. It's been quite a, a steady night so, so far. I'm hoping that once we hit midnight, um, a few people might hit the hit the hay and it might, uh, might slow down a little bit. Anyway, thanks for the broadcast, mate, and um, I'll listen around for the other callbacks as long as I don't get distracted with work. Um, VK3 EKH, VK3 GL. Yeah, thanks, uh, um, uh, Graham, VK3 GL uh, at uh, Bunyip, VK3 EKH returning. Uh, excellent uh, indeed. Thanks for the report. And um, yes, you're uh, also hovering around 30 over 9, so uh, uh, doing pretty good uh, yourself actually. Um, I don't, don't hear you that much on the repeater these days, Gray. I don't know what, what it is. We uh, usually ca catch up uh, uh, in the afternoons on the home trip home or um, uh, other times, but uh, I must say that uh, you are uh, you definitely haven't been on the, on the repeater for a long time, so... Um, uh, <laughs> moving to the country has definitely uh, done something to you. <laughs> anyway, uh, at least you come up here. That's the main thing, and I understand that uh, the the work uh, has probably got you you tied up as well. Uh, so um, uh, I, I wonder if there's any consideration of uh, of, of going back uh, to the uh, main office, or whether it's now a permanent feature to work, work from home, since those uh, settings are being lifted. Um, anyway, we'll catch up. Thanks, Graham. Across to you, Ian, uh, at uh, um, Kangaroo Flat, and I, I think you're still running that 30 watts, uh, was it, or 40 watts? <laughs> 25, I can't remember now. VK3 VIN, VK3 EKH. Great. 
conditions have been huge. VK3VIN, VK3EKH uh, replying. Just a little bit difficult to copy all that uh, in. Um, the, the 20 watts uh, is making it, uh, but um, it's right there on top of the noise floor here, and uh, it was just a bit tricky. But I, 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 the, the book sounds interesting, and uh, I, I know in my own personal library I've, uh, I've got uh, a number of, uh, uh, of uh, books uh, uh, that um, I'd love to sit down and go through in detail. Uh, if I uh, could just find the time to uh, to find the time <laughs> to do that, um, and I actually had a, an article tonight that I was going to read out about John Glenn too. Uh, I, <laughs> it's disappeared off my screen. I'm not sure uh, why that uh, is, but it disappeared. So I'll have to leave that till uh, next week. But um, yeah, no thanks for the report, and it's interesting to note that. Uh, folks are picking up on the, the, the stronger signal tonight which is uh, good to, to see uh, all right thanks Ian um, yeah so you, you, you're pretty much right on the noise uh, I'll give I'll give you a, a four by nine a four by nine really um, you're just sort of hovering there um, so um, yeah uh, but uh, fine on the little radio that you're using it sounds uh, sounds like a nice little um, device to be playing with too um, thanks Ian. Uh, now, uh, Martin, VK7JAH, down there um, in Tasmania. <laughs> VK7JH, VK3, uh, 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 call sign EKH. Go ahead. One, one. Fantastic. Thanks, Martin. VK7JAH in West Lawn System. VK3 uh, EKH returning. <laughs> Excellent stuff. Oh, well, look, I'll, uh, now that I've got the system connected up, I'll, I'll obviously uh, use uh, the, um, uh, the linear device uh, for the broadcasts, and uh, uh, that'll help for sure because the band's actually quite quiet tonight. There's not much in the way of lightning static, although um, if I look at the, uh, the radar, um, there is... Um, there is a lot of lightning. Well, no, actually, there's there's not that much lightning happening really. There's uh, there's lightning happening over Burke, in New South Wales, uh, over Brisbane, um, down Brisbane to uh, Lismore, where there, there's a lot of rain going on down uh, up there at the moment. Uh, there's a, a little bit of lightning up there off the coast of uh, Broome, uh, up towards Darwin. Uh, there's a low pressure system and a little bit of lightning out, uh, out, out at uh, Western Australia there so it's all sort of far away enough not to cause too much of a problem there's also a little bit of rain down there just uh, uh, west of you there in Tasmania too um, I can see on the super radar that we have here <laughs> thanks Martin uh, and uh, like I say I'll, uh, I'll, I've now, now that I've got the system uh, connected up I'll run the, uh, the amplifier uh, more often Thanks, uh, Martin. Good stuff. Um, now, across to VK3JDO. I know that call sign from somewhere. Um, it sounds so familiar, but I'm not sure. Anyway, <laughs> no, I think this is your first time caller. I'm not sure. VK3JDO, VK3EKH. background 
What's the name again? Yeah, thanks, Doug. Um, VK3 JDO, uh, VK3 EKH Echo Kilo Hotel. JDO, where, where, where am I? Oops, there's a call sign, similar call sign. Um, I can't remember now. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But nevertheless, yeah, you're a little bit of QSB on your signal, but uh, just towards the end there, you, you you actually started to come up fairly loud and clear. So. Um, uh, not uh, not doing too bad uh, from uh, Beaconsfield area, I think it was. So thanks, Doug. Thanks very much for calling in first time. Um, if I had a first time call a jingle, I'd play it. <laughs> no, I won't do that. Um, yeah, some of the videos are, are uh, I, I can't do too much about that uh, um, uh, the sound effects in the background. Um, so long they're not uh, obviously um, uh, some song or something. That's I, I can't do much about that. I, I won't uh, play that, of course. Um, but nevertheless, um, yeah, it's a bit of an issue, and uh, I, I know a little bit more uh, uh, EQing could be probably involved uh, to to, uh, to the uh, the system on uh, on uh, on the HF side of it. Um, but uh, if you if you listen to the the YouTube uh, channel, um, of course, the uh, the, the uh, both the video and the, the audio is uh, uh, super fi and uh, I usually run a, an audio stream too. I haven't quite all got, got that sorted out yet, but the audio stream uh, would be also another way of being able to hear things nice and in clarity, good, good fi hi-fi clarity. Um, what was the other thing? Oh yes, um, and um, I, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I think if uh, you could, if uh, you had a, a receiver uh, that you could widen the IF out a little bit on on HF, it would uh, help too because I'm broadcasting a, a little bit of bandwidth uh, as well uh, so uh, a receiver capable of um, being able to adjust your bandwidth out a little bit and uh, perhaps a good uh, quality external speaker uh, would uh, make things sound just that little bit better <laughs> uh, but having said that you know I'm, I'm listening to everybody here on the internal speaker in my radio here uh, I use a uh, uh, an ICOM 756 Pro 3 uh, both on 160, I've got, I've got two of them, two Pro 3s, uh, 756 Pro 3s, and uh, one's set for 160 and one's set for 80 meters. Um, and um, uh, yeah, well, one's got an external speaker on it, the 160 one's got an external speaker, but uh, the 80 meter one I haven't. Um, I haven't fitted the external speaker to that, so it's all very, the audio is very tinny, what I'm hearing here in the shack. Uh, dear, it doesn't matter, I'll fix that up soon. Um, yep, thanks Doug. Uh, now, is there any other stations wishing to check in? VK3 EKH. Uh, VK3 HDH. Go ahead, Don. Yeah, VK3 EKH and the group, VK3 HDH. Sorry, I thought I called in at length, but I must have doubled with someone, Glenn. Um, thanks for the broadcast. Excellent um, tonight. Um, pictures were great. I had the uh, YouTube stream running near a massive uh, signal there. I had a, uh, a couple of shack visitors during the week and um, were showing them how to watch your, uh, your YouTube channel and we ended up um, watching your towel being removed uh, from many years ago. Um, which was uh, quite interesting on your channel, but um, yeah, they were going to uh, have a look in tonight as well. So thanks for the broadcast, excellent as always. And uh, I thought Carica had a uh, interesting smile on her face tonight when she talked about um, the Starlink satellites that were taken out. Um, so she's 
Simon Bess and Raymond Mars. It's <laughs> quite interesting. All right, thanks, and uh, we'll listen again next week. The K3 EKH and the group the K3 HDX. Thanks, Don. Uh, VK3 HDX and acknowledging the other station that quickly called in too. Uh, VK3 HDX, VK3 uh, EKH, you're um, about 30 over 9 uh, as usual. Good, uh, super strong signal here into Nariwar and South. And uh, yes, so I agree. The um, she <laughs> she had a little dig at the SpaceX satellite thing. I, I ran a solar report last week, which she had a little bit more talk about that. Um, uh, so uh, it was only a, a very short video that she had. I think it was a four-minute video, a uh, very quick run-up to um, to her uh, usual ten-minute one that uh, we screened tonight. So um, yeah, certainly uh, the the little. Um, uh, indication of the flare affecting, possibly affecting the SpaceX one was, uh, was certainly indicated tonight. Yes, funny that one, isn't it? Um, all right, now thanks, Don. Good stuff, and uh, g'day to to uh, friends of Don uh, that might be watching tonight as well. Um, very uh, very pleased that you're on board as well. Um, you're more than welcome to, to send a, a, an email to say hi. We were watching uh, VK3 EKH at uh, gmail.com and uh, all will be uh, uh, responded to. Um, okay, who, who was the other station that called in just uh, a while ago? VK3 EKH, listen. Victor Kilo 2, Kilo Juliet, Juliet. VK3, Bad Tender Victoria. Okay, VK2, Kilo Golf Golf, and VK3, Bad Tempted Victorian. Something like that. Like that. <laughs> Go ahead, VK two KGG, VK three EKH. Welcome. I think it was VK two Kilo Juliet, Juliet, VK two KWJ from Wagga Wagga. And thank you for the broadcast. I've been listening to it on 160 meters as well. So good condition here on 80 meters. You are picking up to 30 dB OS nine. Uh, no worries. So, what was the name? Uh, the name is uh, Yana. Uh, the English pronunciation is like Enki Echo Romeo November Yunan. Yunan. Okay. VK2 Kilo Juliet Juliet, VK2 K double J, VK3 EKH returning. Very good. Uh, thanks, uh, Yugen. Um, very good indeed. And uh, good welcome to the uh, to the broadcast, first time. And uh, thank you for the signal reports as well. Uh, very good. I'm glad to, to see that uh, the signal is getting out with some um, strength uh, attached to it. <laughs> um, Yes, the uh, we've been broadcasting here since 1988. Uh, at least, well, I haven't necessarily, but um, for the first 20 years, uh, it was run by um, uh, Russell VK3DRW, and uh, then Russell handed the microphone over to me about 12 years ago. So I've been ma main maintaining the uh, the Friday night uh, broadcast on uh, on uh, since. Uh, since then so uh, it's all been a bit of fun and uh, I've expanded the, the system with the various uh, uh, broadcasts on 160 ATV YouTube um, and whatnot so um, uh, you'll find us here most uh, most Fridays and generally uh, every Friday we, we kick off at 10 o'clock uh, on the, this uh, band in, in 1865 and um, uh, go for about an hour or so try and fill it up with as much as we can Nevertheless, yeah, no, thanks, uh, Jürgen. It's been fantastic. And, uh, or Jürgen, yep, just, just looking now at your QRZ.com page. Look, more information actually can be found uh, on the station with the, if you look at uh, the QRZ.com page for um, for the station here, the K3EKH, and or uh, uh, my own call sign, the K3CSJ, Charlie, Sierra, Julia, and uh, all will be revealed there. <laughs> All right, thanks, mate. Thanks for calling in. Really good to hear. Um, across to Kieran, uh, VK3BTV, VK3EKH. Uh, Kieran, uh, VK3BTV, uh, VK3EKH. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh,
Yeah, no worries, Karen. Um, note that you've changed location, so um, um, I'm not sure if you've got room there to uh, to put up a tower. If that's what you're perhaps thinking of doing at some stage, but uh, yeah, your signal's pretty weak. Um, I think it's actually weaker than uh, than Ian was up there at Kangaroo Flat. So, but uh, it's it's just readable. I can hear what you're saying. If if the band was noisy, it'd be hopeless. Uh, it'd be really hopeless. So uh, yeah, just hanging in there. <laughs> but thanks, Kieran, for calling in. Appreciate. Uh, I, I know you're you're a, a regular uh, listener and watcher. So uh, I do appreciate um, uh, when you come up for sure. Thanks, Kieran. Good on you, mate. Trust you well. Uh, is there anybody else before we disappear? VK3 EKH. Yeah, good day, Tony. Have a say, VK3 VAT, uh, local station, VK3 EKH. No worries, Ethan. Yeah, I can tell you both turned your power up. Um, yeah, but I'll sort of wait for the pun in to um, recover every time you let go of it. The mic, so I'm going to use your continuation. If you flip your, your camera, uh, you're everything's the wrong way around, it's what it usually is, uh, in the background. So you, you've been up to something. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Tony. <clears throat> yes, uh, I, I I wondered if anybody would pick that up. So uh, it was um, uh, I did that just uh, just at the beginning of the the transmission. I mirrored what they call uh, mirrored the um, uh, the image. So that's that's uh, the normal view, which is what the camera sees. Um, but uh, I, I find it frustrating because um, even though that's what the camera sees. Uh, in proportion to everything else in the background, uh, if I go to, you know, brush my hair, I, I, I do it, it. I get confused when I look at it in, in the in the image here. It's it's. I feel like I'm wanting to do this and do that, and it goes all over the place. But um, if I, uh, I I just did an experiment. If I mirrored it like that now, uh, it actually works. I can see it's not a problem. I can now m run my hand through my hair. And it's it's not going to muck it up. So I don't know. It's uh, <laughs> it's just. The way that it appears to me on the vMix uh, monitor here. So anyway, that's mirrored, and of course, if you, you can, if you can read all the text in the background here, it'll all be re reversed. Um, but uh, I can easily go back the other way, of course, uh, back to normal, which is uh, which is that one. All right. Um, thanks, Tony. Good to hear. You. Thanks for calling in, and uh, I think we'll uh, leave it alone at that at this stage. Um, this is uh, VK3 EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. More information about the station can be found at qrz.com uh, forward, forward slash db for database forward slash VK3 EKH. That's the URL that takes you right there, but of course you can always just type in the call sign in the QRZ search engine, which works quite well. Um, yeah. So I uh, hope you found all the reports of uh, and interesting stuff tonight. And uh, again, we'll uh, do, be back next uh, Friday to do it all again. So um, thanks for watching and thanks for listening. Cheers to everybody up there on uh, the QR, uh, the uh, chat window and uh, folks that emailed in too. This is VK3 EKH ASV Radio concluding transmissions on 3541 kHz and uh, on the stream and we'll... Um, See you all next week. Please take care and have a nice week. And uh, don't worry about what's going on overseas too much. Oh, well, it's not very good. But then it's another story. This is VK3 EKH uh, concluding. Bye. All right. So, on that note, for those watching the streams, we shall conclude on the stream as well. And uh, thanks for watching there too. I'll. Um, oh, that's true. So uh, anyway, we shall uh, catch us all uh, next week. Thanks for watching. This is ASV Radio.